that's it. It will not be repeated. So let's continue on and uh, let's start with our first tech talk. And Boris, you have the floor. Engineering automotive systems. All right. Uh, hi, guys. Can you hear me OK? OK, so this is probably uh, the toughest topic uh, of today because when I was asked to come here and talk about engineering automotive systems, my first question was, OK, are we talking about in car? Are we talking about like mobility cloud? What are we talking about? So that was my first uh, big problem. I've been um, a little bit about me. I work in Microsoft as an architect. I've been dealing with like um, constrained environments like vehicles. What should be Microsoft's strategy? From a background perspective, I have been working on our large scale cloud services um, for a long time, actually since we started Azure. I know some of you because I've been engaged in the uh, SDV um, discussions uh, from a Microsoft perspective very early on. So again, then I thought, okay, what am I gonna talk about? I don't need to tell you guys how we roll out cloud services. I don't need to tell you guys how to build automotive solutions because you're all, or most of you, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, you know way more about automotive solutions than I do. So I thought, okay, I got the vision what we're trying to accomplish with STV, right? And part of that vision is if you look at in-car, um, to think about how do we abstract things, how we do increase the developer speed and developer productivity. So I thought, okay, let's do a talk uh, where we can think about how to apply some of the patterns that we know from building cloud native applications into automotive, right? And I have two sections more or less. It's basically first I talk about an engineering tool chain, right? Um, so how could a tool chain look like that might fit um, like the STV artifacts that you guys are working on for in-car, but also for cloud. And the second part is then I'll talk a little bit about um, engineering design patterns of large scale systems. Sounds good or boring, <laughs> right? So see, I did my agenda slide. Uh, again, goal is, um, as I said, engineering practices and design to match the vision of Eclipse STV. Um, I think the most important part, I already said what this talk is about, I think the most important part is the non-goals. Um, this cost solution architectures, because again, it's an engineering, talking about engineering, not about how to architect that stuff. Then discuss all the engineering processes in detail, because as you know, I, th I think if I just talked about automotive engineering process, as much as I know, and I don't know very little about it, probably would feel like an afternoon, right? So we only have 30 minutes just touch on it and then um, provide a solution answer to everything. And I had to do this. It's actually not 42. The answer is ask chat GPT now. Right? So <laughs> that's what you should be doing. All right, so my journey into automotive started like that. Automotive guy and software guy. It's Apple and Mac, although I'm a big Mac fan, right? So automotive guy says, hey, we need to become a software company, right? I meet a lot of customers as part of my job. I come in and say, hey, we have about 300 services. We can help you with everything and anything. We do literally everything you need, right? Then the automotive guy says, oh, great. We're planning to connect about 100 million vehicles, uh, need to serve multiple tenants while honoring regulations. And by the way, we need to transform onboard architectures to mimic cell phones, right? You probably heard like, oh, my car needs to behave like an iPhone. So typical reaction, at least mine, why does everything need to be super complicated in automotive, right? I mean, at least for, for software people. So, but if we think about, if we go back, what is it what we're trying to accomplish? So the engineering North Star, really from an engineering perspective is, you wanna leverage as many of the same processes for your backend development or how you develop your connected vehicle solutions or cloud solutions, but also for what you're using uh, on board, right? That goes like with um, technologies. For example, uh, U protocol is a good uh, 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 example for that. But it also goes for like tools and engineering processes, right? And if you understand, there is actually a, like a very big distinction because an engineering process that you would apply to build cloud native applications as opposed to build applications, build and deploy applications into a safety security domain in the car, right? 
So those are very distinct. But if you think about you're going to deploy something into like uh, the QM domain or for comfort functionality, the entire process doesn't look much different. Right? So the goal is really here uh, to leverage same process, technology, same tools whenever possible while ensuring safety. Yeah. Okay, two different worlds. I mentioned that already, it's very different. Um, so I have a column that calls trans, uh, traditional uh, that applies to like on-prem deployments, but also to automotive that are moving into a more agile cloud native way. And on the right hand side is cloud native. So the quality of code check-ins, and I just got a lecture on that, it really depends on what kind of in-car, in-vehicle um, functionality you're addressing, right? So if you look at like things like drivetrain, they're very close to what you do in cloud native. You have like some sort of unit testing and so on and so forth. But if you look at infotainment, it's, it's really lacking behind. In the cloud native world, um, you've probably heard the term shift left. Who has heard about the term shift left? Okay, couple. So shift left means you're gonna shift a lot of the testing, integration and all that type of stuff where you're trying to capture as many issues early on when the developer writes and checks in the code, right? In the cloud native world, we typically do that through a lot of unit tests. So when we check in code, there is an entire test process that runs and checks it right away and says, look, you're not compliant, you're missing this, you're missing that, and you're not even allowed to check in the code. Right, that saves a lot of time because you're not going into uh, moving that code through a pipeline and then you do integration testing and things like that and then it falls apart. The next thing is um, the environment creation configuration. So if you think about like a uh, cloud native way or when you guys build your um, backends, I would assume you're going to use something like infrastructure as code. So it's a very automated process, right? Because you want to have a declarative way to describe your environment. You can check in the declare, uh, declarative model and say, this is my environment. So you have a trace basically of what's happened. And then the uh, creation is actually automated. In the automotive world, or even in some on-prem worlds, it's mainly manual. Uh, you guys would agree with that so far or not? Okay, so that's a tough spot. All right, so deployment frequency, again, in automotive, it depends um, what I've, we've learned. But more importantly, in the cloud native world, um, you deploy whenever needed, right? So it can be multiple times a day. If you think about uh, hyperscalers, whether it's like us, Microsoft, Google, or Amazon, uh, we'll, we'll, we deploy batches or we fix services throughout the day. Like it can be if the fix is not right multiple times, obviously it takes a little bit as it goes into productions, but there is no like long planning process. It's literally like uh, whenever we need a fix, we'll roll it out. It's obviously more difficult in the automotive space. I realize that, but I think um, there is some synergies there as well. App deployment process requires meetings and planning. Uh, um, in the cloud native world, there's a push button deployment, right? Because there's a, if you look at the last uh, row, there is a culture of trust. And because you have an automated engineering process, you have automated tests, you're actually kind of like secure that if a developer says, I want to deploy that thing, that that code is kind of like rock, rock solid, right? It's not like, oh, it's going to break my production environment. It's really like, okay, I've set up the system in a way that I catch a lot of the issues up front, shift left, and that my subsequent testing is actually catching the rest. And that's why you have that uh, push button deployment as opposed to requires meeting and planning. Hey, are we ready to deploy this? Deployment validation, manual versus automated. And then the next part is really super important observability. Um, so there is, I wouldn't say minimal to none um, observability, but most of the things uh, we have seen, there's a lot of diagnostics and monitoring going on but there is very little observability, meaning you have an understanding of the entire system, right? I'll give you a very, very interesting example when, God, I'm so old. It was like 11 years ago in Azure, we had an issue that a customer was complaining that they had a performance issue, right? And the performance issue was in a milliseconds. So they were monitoring their stack. It was in a milliseconds range. And we couldn't back then, 
like we just re-architected Azure, we really had a hard time to figure out what it was, right? And the reason was because at that time, every time they experienced a performance issue, an upgrade through the data set was rolling through the data center, right? So typically it doesn't, it doesn't impact the user's application, but there was an update rolling through. So with observability back then in place, we would have caught that right away, but it took us a long time to figure out why it's taking so long. Obviously, needless to say, observability is now like throughout the Microsoft Azure stack. But it, it was a really good example why you need to have observability for the entire stack. And that's also another difference here. So some engineering principles uh, should be considered. Again, there is a lot of um, principles that can be applied, but those are the ones we have as part of our engagements with a lot of you uh, and, and your employers figured out. Those are probably very useful. So there are some organizational challenges, right? Because not, or most of the time, it's not a technology problem. It's really a technology, it's really an organizational problem. So in a cloud world um, or in a cloud native engineering world, we have small teams with a bounded context. That means you have a team that focuses in one functionality and then functionality only. If you then apply things like loose coupling and things like that, you can actually evolve and deploy those things independently. Also, there is a notion of you build it, you run it, right? So we're shifting a lot of the um, responsibility to the developer, right? So meaning, hey, a developer can write code, but then they, they leave it up to the tester, they will catch it or not. But if you say something like you build it, you run it, you're actually shifting a lot of the responsibility to the developer. And the way I usually did that uh, was one of the teams I was working with, we, we basically put up a pager, right? And said, look, it's your code. If it goes wrong, there is a pager. That means you get a call during the night. So it's a different culture, right? Automation is one thing I mentioned it before. Uh, there's obviously infrastructure as code, but now there's also GitOps uh, gaining a lot of traction uh, where you actually say, look, um, in your case, a vehicle should actually pull for a change and then pull it down. I'm aware there's a lot of restrictions, but it's safer because um, you can basically uh, guarantee who's going to access it and not. Observability, I already talked about that. One important thing there is, um, because if you're building, and this is more for the cloud, I think, than for in-car, but in your services, in your cloud services, if you're building um, a microservices architecture, if you're using a microservices architecture, right? Typically, a re request spans multiple services, right? It's not just one service serves the request and it's done. It's going through service A, service A is calling service B, and so on and so forth. So what you need to do there is uh, correlate the events so that you have a trace of the entire um, request that goes through the system and is being returned. Uh, because if that's not the case, you really don't know where things go wrong. And then you need to use a standard, right? Right now, I know you guys are also in your diagnostics working groups and stuff like that, using at open tele, uh, looking at open telemetry, because especially if you have different technology stacks, different vendors, it's important that you standardize on a format. And open telemetry is now turning out to be really the good format because it's in car, but it's also being used in the cloud. So uh, some learnings there. Testing, shift to a testing pyramid, which basically means shift left. Um, again, I said before, that means putting a lot more emphasis on the developer. Testing service in isolation does not offer much value. I mean, it's clear you need to do some integration testing at some point. And then decide between safe and fast. And I put that in there because if you think about in-car, and now you can say, hey, Boris, cloud guy, you have no idea. But if you look at in-car, you have technically two different cycles, right? You have a cycle that is responsible for handling development or the engineering process for safety and security components. And you have one that is responsible for comfort functionality, right? Those are two different cycles, if you think about. Uh, the one has to be safe, it needs to be super compliant. The other one can be fast, because if you're gonna deploy an application that has a different ambient light and your light is now green instead of red, doesn't really matter. But if you deploy something that is security relevant, that's not working, because of all the testing, this actually has a high impact. So for whatever you do in your engineering process, you need to decide between uh, safe and fast. Service design, also very important that you, um, especially if you use different technologies, that you have contracts between your services. 
and again, you see uh, I'm putting something else out there again. Um, we in Microsoft, we leverage a lot of open API now because it's the way to describe your contract. It's a way to describe your, your APIs. And then you can actually make services talk to each other in, a, in an easy way. And that goes like for uh, car to cloud communication, but also for your backend communication. So why I'm saying all of that? Um, again, where I'm headed with that is a proposal to you guys, and it's food for thought. The first one is the safe uh, deployment, right? As I mentioned, it follows traditional automotive development uh, and deployment practices like ASPIs, ISO 2620, whatever you have there, right? It's less frequent component update, it's safety and security critical components, artifacts are binaries, and it's in car only. But if you look at the um, fast, uh, approach. It follows cloud native process, so you can use a DevOps process, you can use a GitOps process. It goes into queued and staged environment. Again, when I said like you can deploy or automate everything, that doesn't mean you have a click button deployment into a car, right? It means it goes into some place where it's ready to be deployed, right? There's a difference between continuous delivery and continu continuous deployment. But those are the things that are frequent component updates. And if you think about that, if you have functionality in your car that updates frequently, that's not safety critical. You can use cool things like Chariot, Ibeji, U protocol to abstract those comfort functionalities away from like the deeply embedded functionality. You can actually implement the same engineering process as for cloud native applications, right? So that's why that fast is more non-safety security relevant components and you can apply it for cloud and car. Make sense so far? Or? Okay. So this is a nice picture um, that I've been trying to draw, and this is really where I'm getting to, right? So if we think about like the North Star, where I said, hey, wouldn't that be cool if I can use similar technologies, and I'm purposely saying similar technologies and patterns in the cloud as well as in the car, right? Haishi is gonna talk later about like Kubernetes in a car, but Reality is cloud native technologies are being built for servers in the cloud or on-prem and not for in-car. So not every cloud native technology is um, suitable for in-car development. But there's certain things that we can change and implement that mimic cloud, cloud native patterns. So one of those things is if I want to use the same engineering process, the same engineering life cycle is I have an artifact repo, right? Um, so for example, you have a, a container registry and an OCI compliant container registry can store any artifact. It's not just containers, but you have a repo. But then underneath you have something like, which I call star or asterisk as code, right? So in the cloud world, you have something like infrastructure as code. There's also some things that we've worked on, which is like you have a declarative way to do, uh, describe your application. You describe your infrastructure plus applications. There's like many variations of it, right? But key is it's a declarative way to say, okay, this is my desired state that I want to have, right? So on the left-hand side, you could have something similar. And I had discussions with some of you in the room uh, about, I think it was called system as code. We could say, look, for automotive in-car development, you could also come up and doesn't exist, right? It's like a community task but you could come up with something that describes the desired state of your car or your model, right? In a declarative way. So once you have that and you say, I have a description of declarative model for in-car, I have a declarative model for the cloud, the process is pretty much the same. So on the left-hand side, component A is a safety and security relevant component. So that means it needs to go through the entire ASPICE through the entire process, right? But in the end, once that component went through your entire testing um, frameworks, your test benches, whatsoever, the component is ready to be like deployed. Then the component can end up in the artifact store, right? Because it's a binary. You put it up there. And at the same time, you can update uh, your declarative model and say, hey, I have a new version of component A sitting there in the repo. Right, So you basically now have your desired state. It changed, let's say, from component A version 1 to component A version 2. Now, for the fast part, um, it's the same thing. You basically develop your stuff, but this is more the accelerated, a fast um, engineering process. 
Raiden also update the infrastructure or the, the system as code declaration and you say, look, this is my new desired state for the car. Now there are different ways to do this. So there is a deployment mechanism or you can pull it, but important, there is an important concept. If you have something like, let's say, a system as code description for your car, this is how it should look like. You need something, I call it item potent operations, right? I don't call it control plane or management plane. Heishi is going to do that later. But you need something that says, OK, I have a new desired state of my applications, for example, right? And because you're now going into a world where you have composite applications, that's my new desired state. So what you need is something like that executes item potent operations, because now you come in with that model and you see, hey, there is version component A has changed from version one to version two. So all you want to update is component A and not the entire thing. So what this control plane then does is it basically updates only the changed components and leaves the other one alone, right? So you don't need to worry, hey, am I breaking anything? Because it captured everything in your as part of your engineering process before. But the key is that the item potent operations control plane then looks at the actual state of your vehicle and the components in the vehicle and then applies the desired state. So if you think about those um, like flows here and you can have offline discussions how that might look like. It's actually if we build a tool chain, an STV tool chain that supports that in an open and modular way, this is how we believe we can actually um, bring um, accelerated engineering processes to the automotive world, right? And the benefits for you is you don't have to have like necessarily completely different processes for everything you do because you could actually capture a lot of the cases uh, through the uh, same engineering tool chain. OK, so let me step back because I have five minutes. Any questions so far is like, OK, this guy after the break, let him talk about some desired state, actual state. OK, does it make sense or is it like, oh my god, those cloud guys. I see some nodding, I see some, OK. I think it does make sense. I just wonder how this works with the automotive industry already having invested billions in their OTA infrastructure. So you heard, you're, talking, you're talking about in five, six, seven years, right? For yeah. That generation. This is really, think about what I'm talking about. That's food for thought, right? You have a great community here, right? You are the automotive industry, right? Who, who is? I mean, you guys are, aren't you not? You are, right? This is yours to change because look, all the efforts you're putting into what you're working groups on control planes, right? Abstraction layers, protocols, right? You need to go all the way. And I think like an engineering process is actually a big part of it, right? And this group together, like the Eclipse STV Foundation can change that in my mind. Can you go back one slide? Sure. At the very bottom, no, two slides, sorry. Uh, at the very bottom on the left, you said consider serialization <laughs> costs. Can you comment on that? Yeah, so. Um, Who has heard about microservices? <laughs> it's cool. It's almost like chat GPT, right? So what's happening in microservices world is a a lot of people go completely overboard, right? It, it, it's actually what they build is micro functions, right? Not microservices. Now, the idea of a microservice is that every service has a bounded context and a responsibility, right? So now service A calls service B. So you're going to pass on some data. Right, so what's happening is you're going to serialize the data in service A, right? You pass it on to service B, you deserialize it. That's fine if you do it like with two services, right? And you have not a big data body to serialize. But if you do that, and I, I'm not lying, I've seen like customers with 10,000s of services, that, that's why I called it functions, you're paying a serialization penalty, right? Because for that data payload, you're serializing, deserializing all the time, and that gives you a performance penalty. Might not be hard between two services, but if you go like a chain of 100 or 200 services, this is where you're going to pay a penalty. And then you're wondering, oh, wait a minute, my request takes so long. Database guy, it's your fault. I know you don't have, you know? So that's really what we mean. And um, I think there's not a lot of talk about that, especially in like a microservices world. Um, but this is really, if you have a lot of services, this is really where you pay a cost, and a lot of people don't realize that. That's why I put it there. 
Do you, have, do you want to share any experience when it comes to, say, serializing protobufs? Um, I don't have, because when we did that was before, right? But uh, I can follow up on that, because we have teams who've done that. Fairly. All right, so um, done. OK, last one is, I mean, you know all of that, right? So there are certain design principles that you can apply to car and cloud. So loose coupling, I mean, in a vehicle, you already have like fairly loose coupling between like those those individual services. Fault tolerance, I think it's an important concept, but I don't need to tell or talk about fault tolerance in a car. That's probably the safest thing there is, because if you don't have any fault tolerance in there, people die, I guess, right? So scalability is an interesting aspect, maybe uh, down the road, because a lot of people think about putting orchestrators and schedulers in a car, right? But that also means you want to probably scale and schedule across ECUs at some point. But there is other interesting aspects. So for example, you could scale into the cloud, but designing for scalability. Consistency is something you should think about like in uh, connected scenarios, for example, like what happens if you're gonna send some data somewhere and we all know fallacy of distributed computing, network is not reliable, what you're gonna do then, how you handle that. Uh, security is a given, uh, performance obviously in car is uh, is, is paramount for certain functionalities and then interoperability, which goes into like this open AVI uh, aspect and things like that. So with that, I think on the spot. So that was the wake up or you guys are even more tired now, like half hour talk yeah, after so the I, break. I, I'd say we can, we can have one question. Wow. wow. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone? So with fault tolerance, you're not referring to availability, I guess. No. We can have a second one. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. That is good. We can have a second one. I'm going all out. I would disagree with loose coupling on vehicles. Ole. You would? <laughs> Appreciate it, guys. <laughs> Great. Yeah, so that's been really, really thought-provoking and... Uh, We'll, we'll keep it yeah, going. if I'm going to come back in four years, right, you guys have that tool chain, right? It's a new working group. Absolutely. Okay. So thanks cool. a lot. It's been a really good talk.